video nine in preparing spiritually for the Savior's return. And we go with this one from what was a pretty heavy topic and one that um, has potential for disagreement and, and um, contention even to the greatest topic. And at the same time, still one that um, I really need to get out of the way of to convey it in a way that that he wants me to and that can be um, felt and not just and not just heard. But before diving into that, I um, have had a couple thoughts in my mind that have been a little bit of an addendum to what was discussed last time and, and not really substantively, but just something that shows how how the Lord works and reminds me of how he weaves our lessons together, right? Our individual lesson plans, he weaves things together in them for us to to kind of maximize our, our learning. And, and in this, I was um, looking yesterday at some of the uh, significance and symbols of the, the eclipse, which was our second video. Um, and I, my attention was really drawn to the date from my notes on in which I received that and had that really neat experience for me where things just opened up and, and rushed at me and, and I was able to understand some things about the significance of the, the eclipses. And I looked at that date, it was June 27th. And, um, and in my mind popped and I had been thinking a little bit about this previous event too, but in my mind popped the f a fire that happened on our hill, which was a part of a beginning for me in being able to hear him and, and tell him thy will be done. And I, I just had this thought, check the date. And, um, and so yesterday, last night, I, I went in and I knew before I even checked it, I knew it was going to be the same day. And sure enough, June 27th of 2020 was the day of that fire and the day that I said a prayer standing above this hill. And I'll show you here a little clip of the, those moments as this fire came down, raging down this hill right here. And... Um, almost took out our homes and the wind was so strong as it came down everyone thought it was going to um, and I said a prayer up there um, that I felt prompted to say thy will be done and I don't need this home we were all out safe everyone was evacuated except for me I probably should have been but I was up there spraying and praying um, working and, and trying to exercise faith and that was a beginning for me of some things that have happened, you know, over these last three years, but it was three years ago to the day. It is right there. And this, this clip here, was when I was interviewed right as the wind had stopped. And um, I think I, I laugh at myself at the end because we're watching it actually at a neighbor's or a, a friend's house a few miles away as we were all evacuated uh, and, and it came on the news. Smoke is very thick. Uh, uh, the smell smoke. Um, and we ran out and saw that we, we thought that about an hour ago when we first saw it that it was going to pop over the hill in a moment. Mm -hmm. It took a while for it to do that, but the winds were also incredibly strong at that time. Mm -hmm. And in the last 10 or 15 minutes, right as they got right next to the house, they just died down, which is, you know, really grateful for that. <laughs> but anyway, that in a way, for me personally, was a reminder of the Lord of how these things are interconnected. That fire, we were actually protected from that fire. That that um, angels I know protected us from the elements 
and um, this this firefighter here after the event after he fought this fire and he knew that those winds stopped miraculously right as they reached our back property line um, and, and all of our neighbors here and that served to soften hearts it um, was a was one step of an, of a couple of steps that happened for me in me starting to, to become temporally prepared we'll talk a little bit more about a little bit more about that journey and I've mentioned it before but in this discussion I think it's going to come up again and and then also our neighbors it, it was the beginning of what prepared them to uh, several months later um, fill cultural halls relief society rooms and and um, begin to really become temporally prepared, which led to, to spiritual preparation and some really neat experiences up on our hill. But for me personally, the Lord was showing me both that connection with the elements and his work to both both uh, cleanse and to protect from them and cleanse with them uh, that we discussed last time, as well as uh, just how he he actually works with numbers and he shows us things through numbers those three years into the day I know have significance for me, but uh, a number of things that um, I won't get into, he was he was showing me. But they are all connected, right? His lesson plans are so perfect. He uh, he weaves the perfect tapestry. So for this topic, which is entering into the presence of the Savior, um, some things that need to be said as we begin, and. Um, one of them, the first one, is that you think about this topic and and you may ask, and in fact I did myself because this was not on the list of what I thought I was going to uh, speak to the different topics, uh, even though it's, it's critically important. Um, it wasn't because of this reason that 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 yoking to the Savior or that part of the doctrine of Christ that is... Um, him as a second comforter and in our our making our or him making his abode and the father with us right that is all in the scripture um, all over in the scriptures is a very personal and a very individualized thing okay and in fact second you know nephi in in the end of second nephi near the end of his writings as he's describing the doctrine of christ he's actually getting to this he describes steps that we're very familiar with of the doctrine of Christ but then he says in an important statement and there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh and he continues to say I can't say more I cannot say more the spirit stoppeth my utterance I'm left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the stiff neckedness of people of men so and you, you will find that if you look through the scriptures, you'll see several instances where this a similar statement is made, where a prophet is teaching about these doctrines and the principles that have us approach the veil, and then their their utterance is stopped. Okay, so so that is that's definitely true. We see that throughout the scriptures, and that veil of unbelief is what's over all of us. We, the natural man, certainly does not want to believe does not believe that um they can be in the presence of the lord in life right that's just not anything um that that's something that satan is going to fight all the time okay so there's that okay and then then there's another layer to this and that is it's an, an interesting thing has has happened in this last dispensation that um I, I know is not new, but is is something that's important to recognize, and that is that whenever you see, we've all seen things like um, the day bells, right, or people who have gone off the rails on on doctrine. They've taken a doctrine and they've just gone with it, right, and and they've started. Many of these people have started with with true principles, um, you know, election. Uh, the second comforter, even food storage, right? It's my guess that everyone watching this, um, or at least most of you, 
know someone who has twisted a doctrine and gone and kind of gotten lost maybe just mildly lost or maybe severely lost and and it, the interesting thing about this and something i think is really important to, re to recognize about what the adversary is doing here is is twofold one we know that as he does this he's attempting to get those people off the co off the, the course off the straight and narrow path and as many as will follow them the numbers of people that follow them are pretty small if you really look at it there's not a whole lot um, but it's terrible for those that are deceived and, and go astray um, fall away from from what essentially is priestcraft but we don't think a lot about the other side of this what happens when we see that occur when we especially if we know someone personally and i know that some of you do but when we see it occur just generally we gain a layer of fear about those doctrines and i'm not talking about things that aren't not that there aren't revealed or that are incorrect principles i'm talking about true principles and as we go through this today you'll see that what we're going to talk about is what has been revealed and and these are things to have you start thinking that and recognizing that we live far beneath our privileges and this is a topic that's important for the moment that we live in the time that we live in especially and we'll, we'll discuss that but it is important to recognize that the adversary uses that fear to keep us from the doctrines altogether to keep us from the mysteries of godliness we we think we, we hear people say all the time oh those are the mysteries you know we're not supposed to study those it's actually it, as express as could be all through the scriptures that that we are actually to understand that's an invitation that we have from our heavenly father to understand the mysteries of godliness to understand the greater things of the kingdom and we're going to talk about about that a little bit more here but it's an invitation and it's actually a responsibility if we are to get closer and closer to the savior and be yoked with him we need to understand far more than what Nephi said before he stopped his utterance. And so what I've observed and felt um, by the Spirit is that Satan has actually gotten more people to stop seeking to understand the gospel and, and true and correct principles that bring us back to our Savior and to our Heavenly Father by fear than he has actually by following those who fall away and who who are deceived by uh twisting these doctrines and so it, it's really important to 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 be moderate in these things right to to remember as we as we go through scriptures here today and we go through the words of prophets they are they are what they say they mean what they say and they may be a little bit surprising in how at least some of them how overt they are and how um, grand the promises are but we need to believe them as, as a, a friend just um, reminded yesterday reminded me yesterday um, part of the veil of unbelief over this generation is that we we will not seek to understand the greater things that the, the the fullness we we are satisfied and we're going to talk a lot about what that means and how that's similar just exactly the same as what's happened in times past with the people of Moses and and others but so why are we talking about this if it's personal why why discuss it what I have felt in um, being prompted over this last week that this is the topic to discuss today for me and to share the things that he has, um, the Lord has shown to me through the prophets and, and the scriptures, is that we need to recognize that we live far beneath our privileges. We need to recognize the times that we live in. Remember this, that we live in a unique time. All will see him who remain when he comes in his glory. And if the Savior were to return within the next 10 years, and I'm not doing timelines, that's not the intent of this, but just think of proximity. If, if he was to return soon, if his return is um, not far ahead, then everyone watching this will see him in the next 10 years. And, and that means even if, you know, if some don't make it to that time, whenever that is, um, they'll see him on the other side of the veil. 
and will be participating in the events leading up to the second coming. But those who are here um, will see him actually most before he comes in his glory. We know that before he comes in his glory, he makes at least three appearances that are most clearly recorded. He'll appear at Adam and Diamond. He'll appear in <clears throat> the New Jerusalem in his temple. And he'll appear on the Mount of Olives to the Jews in Jerusalem. And there's another reference that is interesting by Wilford Woodruff speaking of words that President or that uh, Joseph Smith shared in a quote that we're familiar with um, for the most part of it, it's the but it's the first part of this quote we are most often hear about the Rocky Mountains that uh, people will go to the Rocky Mountains. But he continued to say that the Latter Day Saints who dwell in those mountains will stand in the flesh to see the sun coming of the Son of Man. The Son of Man will come unto them while in the Rocky Mountains. So. Not going <clears> to <throat> go into that any more, but those. But you see that before he comes in his glory, the vast majority of those who follow him and are his disciples will have already seen him. And so, it is important. And and when we discussed in a previous video, previous discussion, the the reasons to overcome. Remember that one of the primary and so important reasons to overcome was to be able to abide his presence. Okay, and we're going to talk more about in this discussion about that all-important verse. And it's going to kind of come down to this. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And when we wrap up all of this, these discussions, which are certainly not comprehensive of, of everything, but when we wrap up the things that I've been prompted to share on spiritual preparation... Ultimately, being prepared to greet the Savior and to serve him and usher in his coming is the primary purpose, right? Being able to, to uh, abide his presence and being able to um, be ready for that day. So, this is not an extra mile discussion, right? Endure to the end is what we think of when we think of the last step of the doctrine of Christ. Um, the generation that welcomes the Savior needs to be ready to receive him it needs to understand the the principle and the prophecies associated with rending the veil it needs to understand why the, the story of the brother jared is in the book of mormon why so many stories one after another speak to um, individuals being brought back into the presence of the savior the generation that receives him which I believe is this generation, needs to be ready for that and needs to be able to abide that day. And even before he comes, we need to be yoked to him. We need to be like him. And we're going to see how the recipes and the scriptures link those two. When we're like him and we are abiding in him, um, we are prepared to enter into his presence. And this discussion is not just about sight. That's not the purpose of this. What we're talking about and what the second comforter itself is, as we're going to go in here and look, is, um, is far more than just the, the wonderful privilege of being brought back into the physical presence of the Savior. It is becoming one with him, even as he and the Father are one. We are invited and exhorted by him to be one with him, and we need to do that. That's President Nelson's invitation to overcome the world which is that's exactly what this is what we're talking about today is what that was in more explicit express i'll say terms that's what he was talking about in that talk and it is not just a as i mentioned before an extra mile thing if you want to do the next thing if you want to get even closer he is telling us what we need to do he was calling upon us to be ready for the Savior's second coming and we're going to talk about what he meant or what he was saying we need to do to be ready and in different terms than we did in that other discussion a little bit same principle different way to describe it he gave us an apostolic blessing to overcome the world and that's that is more than than just nice to do okay um that's that's our our prophet really exhorting us and i guess i'm going to say this i'm supposed to say this one more time 
Everyone knows someone who's gone off the deep end on topics like this, on ascension, calling an election, even food storage, as I mentioned. Satan has got so many through fear and more than he's, he's gotten by going off the deep end itself. Um, it certainly makes us cautious when we see that. And it makes people really actually even not recognize black and white doctrines in scripture out of fear. They don't disavow them, but they, it has the same result. They read past them or they try to make them less than what they clearly say. We live in a time with responsibility. We have hard things to do ahead. While we have to be cautious, the way to judge is clear, right? Is We can know with a perfect knowledge, as was discussed in the last, the last video, we can't be immobilized from truly being spiritually ready for the Savior's return. The way to judge is plain. So we stick with the patterns that are in the scriptures, and then, but then we, we believe and we exercise faith in the words of the scriptures. We have to really believe what President Nelson has said himself, that the Savior will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again, that we will see miraculous indications that God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ preside over this church, that it won't be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting and constant influence of the Holy Ghost, that physically as well as spiritually the time is coming that those who do not obey the Lord will be separated from those who do, that it is our charge, our privilege to help prepare the world for his return, that wonderful things are ahead, that we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. And just think on that for a second. Ponder that and don't put a veil of disbelief over it. Don't diminish what he's saying through unbelief. This, this is one of the great victories of the adversary that we will read through these things because we're afraid to interpret them the way that they are written, the way that he spoke them. We will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful coming into his presence, being commissioned of him before he comes in his glory, which we know happens um, it, at least at Adam and Diamond and in the temple in New Jerusalem, certainly constitutes privileges, blessings, and miracles. And we're going to talk more about that. I'm not saying the days ahead will be easy, but I promise you the future will be glorious for those who are prepared. Um, and then from that talk, we are to become a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again, who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world, and who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. Okay, He calls upon us to, to become that. And so we need to understand really what that call is and what he's, he's asking us here. And we're going to talk about that in a in, in the context of um, being one with the Savior and overcoming and being uh, and abiding with him in this discussion today. Okay, so let's talk about what has been said. And this is one of the primary responsibilities that I feel like I have. And, in, in, you know, some of what I've shared for some people is nothing new. And for others, it may sound crazy. But the purpose, what I'm supposed to do, I know primarily in this discussion, is to show what has been said and to try to put some pieces together to help um, understand or to reaffirm feelings that, that people may have, have had, that I know people have had, uh, about this, this um, part of the doctrine of Christ. And, and to try to help us understand why a little bit better how it's possible, and um, and what what we do with it, because in the end, as I said, it's definitely true that what happens and how this happens for each person is extremely individual. Just as President Nelson said, "Tell the Lord you're serious about overcoming, and ask Him what to do next and what to do next." The lesson plan is individual. We are talking about the principles that govern it, and the invitations that are there. The invitation from the Lord. So Spencer W. Kimball said, I have learned that where there is a prayerful heart, a hungering after righteousness, a forsaking of sins, and obedience to the commandments of the Lord, the Lord pours out more and more light until there is finally power to pierce the heavenly veil 
and to know more than man knows. A pers person of such righteousness has the priceless promise that one day he shall see the Lord's face and know that he is. Okay, he's referring here to rending the veil as we come, and we're not going to get sidetracked on the how-to right now. I just feel to share some of these things so, so that it can sink in that the invitation is real and that it is not just me saying these things. Adam actually tried to bring his posterity into the presence of the Lord, and so did Moses. Um, Nephi and Jacob did. And you'll see, you can see these scriptures that show expressly, clearly, that they were trying to bring their people back into the fullness of the presence, the glory of the Lord while in life. Um, and each event failed except for one, right? And that was, that was Enoch and his people. And we know that great are the prophecies surrounding what Enoch and his people are to do uh, in days ahead, but also great is the pattern in what happened. In this dispensation, Joseph Smith did as well. And he described some of those past attempts. He, he said, this is why Adam blessed his posterity. He wanted to bring them into the presence of God. They looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He said, in continuing this quote, Moses sought to bring the children of Israel into the presence of God through the power of the priesthood, but he could not. In the first ages of the world, they tried to establish the same thing, and there were Eliases raised up who tried to restore these very glories, but did not obtain them. President Nelson is doing the same thing right now. And the prophecies are, and what we know is true, is that this time it works. The reestablishment, the redemption of Zion, and the New Jerusalem, is a fulfillment of that. And when those peoples are ready, um, the, uh, the Savior returns to that place and the city of um, the people of Enoch do also. Paul spoke of this dispensation, of the fullness of times when God would gather together all things in one. And those men to whom these keys have been given will have to be there. And they without us cannot be made perfect. That's an interesting tie too. And it's a, it's a side topic that we, I don't think is the topic for today, but the spirit of Elijah and how that plays a role in the second coming. We will talk about the um, about the temples a little bit in rending the veil. So when Joseph Smith and the early saints were not able to live the law of consecration, they were removed from um, Jackson County and left that, that land. And really, like Moses, they entered into um, the wilderness, right? And that's what happened. And it, it may not be something that everyone uh, wants to believe, but we're still in the wilderness. Um, and uh, and that doesn't mean that great things haven't happened and, and the uh, the church hasn't rolled forth because it has. And, and this was always prophesied to happen. But let's look back just a little bit at the words in Scripture surrounding what happened with Moses. And this is the very thing that is still a veil of unbelief on us. From Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 23. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter his rest, into his rest while in the wilderness which rest is the fullness of his glory. Okay, so that the people of Moses chose, and, and in other verses you'll see, they essentially said, Moses, you talk to God. We'll just, just, we can't, we're not worthy of that, or we're, that's too much for us. You talk to him and just tell us what he says. What a blessing it is that we have a prophet. That prophet, President Nelson, tells us to hear him. He invites us to approach our Heavenly Father and our Savior, and he tells us that we have to, that with urgency, this is a time where we need to have that personal connection. He is inviting us to live up to our privileges as it relates to abiding with Christ. We are to be different than the people of Moses and the Israelites who couldn't endure his presence or didn't want it. They, were, they said it's enough, 
and and so Moses you know, was removed from them. They were the, the higher law, which the law and we'll talk about here is associated with uh, the presence of of the Lord and the, and the ministry of the Lord directly, was taken away from them, and they were left with the lower priesthood, uh, the Aaronic priesthood, and the preparatory gospel. Really quickly, Jacob, chapter one, verse seven. And there's, you know, there's more in verses before this, but primarily here, verse 7. Wherefore, we labor diligently among our people, that we might persuade them to come unto Christ and partake of the goodness of God, that they may might enter into his rest. Now, remember, there's that word again, rest. And President Nelson used the word rest over a dozen times in his talk overcoming the world. The rest of the Lord is, as we saw in um, that verse in the Doctrine and Covenants, is a fullness of his glory. The fullness of rest in Christ is actually abiding in him. That's where we obtain that fullness of rest. This rest is speaking also to his presence. Lest by any means he should swear in his wrath that they should not enter in, as in the provocation in the days of temptation while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Okay, and so he's referring to that exact same story. And he's saying that they were trying to bring their present, their their people, their children, back to Christ and have them receive essentially the second comforter, right? To be able to abide in him and to be ministered to um, by him. Okay, so let's talk about that term, that title, the second comforter, right? This is where a lot of people be like, ah, yeah, all kinds of crazy folks um, have gotten off track with this, but it is really important actually to understand. We progress and and if you think of the temple and you think of covenants you think of this progression from the Aaronic to the Melchizedek and you think of the progression between telestial to terrestrial to celestial you think of the progression from entering at the gate receiving first um the light of Christ, visitation of the Holy Ghost, a portion of the Holy Ghost, after we receive um, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost, we have that right, but that doesn't mean that we receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. President Nelson told us, by the way, right, that it's critical that we receive the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, and that refers to a fullness of the Holy Ghost. And then we receive a portion as we approach the veil of the and the Holy Ghost, right, is the comforter. And then we receive a portion of the, the second comforter. And we are brought to um, the veil. And you can look at the Old the Old Testament and how the Temple of Solomon is set up. But angels bring us to the veil. The, uh, the Holy Ghost participates as we are brought to the veil. And and then the veil um, is, is Christ. And Christ brings us to the Father, okay? So just think about that, how that progression works. And remember that the veil of the temple, just as it was in times of old, um, never was death. People think of like passing through the veil and they think of death. It does not represent death. Um, and it is not something that we, as we rend the veil, as the brother of Jared did, is not something that should be looked upon as, oh yeah, well that happens when I die. So that set that aside now for a minute and let's look at doctrine and covenants 88 it speaks with a begins with a promise that god would send to joseph smith and others another comforter um who is the holy ghost functioning as the holy spirit of promise later these brethren learned that there was another promise available to those who sanctified themselves who had their minds single to god and to cast away their idle thoughts and their excess of laughter that great and last promise is that God would unveil his face to the righteous. So Joseph Smith referred to that appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ as, an, as the other comforter or the last comforter. He said, there are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost, the same as given on the day of Pentecost, and that all saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism. The first comforter is the Holy Ghost. The other comfort spoken of is the subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation and this generation, I, I will insert. After a person has 
have faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. That's, that's calling an election, another doctrine we're all afraid of. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazard, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be the privilege to receive the other comforter. Now, what is this other comforter? It is no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is the sum and substance of the whole matter, that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him. And they will take up their abode with him. And the visions of heaven will be opened unto him. And the Lord will teach him face to face. And he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place of the ancient saints arrived when they had such glorious visions. Isaiah, Ezekiel, John on the Isle of Patmos, St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. There are so many things that could be said about this, but I'm just going to leave it at the words that were spoken by the prophet. President Joseph Fielding Smith has, has written, There are thousands who believe in the promise of the Lord, that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me, and calleth on my name, and obeyeth my voice, and keepeth my commandments, shall see my face and know that I am. And this promise is to, unto all men everywhere, so that they may know if they will. The scriptures testify of it all over and just, these are just a couple right there's so many and some of them we'll read in the context of uh teachings of the prophets here in a minute but john 14 23 and jesus answered and said unto him if a man love me he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him those words are important when you see abiding in um it refers to this same principle of the second comforter that is jesus christ Doctrine and Covenants 93, Verily thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. Uh, DNC 67.10 And again, Verily I say unto you that it is your privilege and a promise that I give you that have been ordained unto this ministry that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me for you are not sufficiently humble we can all work on that. The veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am, not with the carnal, neither with the natural mind, with the spirit, but with the spiritual. Abraham was not content with living the gospel superficially, but desired to be, as he said, a greater follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive greater instructions and keep the greater commandments of God. And we know what happened uh, as that occurred. And in fact, as you look at the pattern of the scriptures, and, and you can do this with the Old Testament, with the New Testament, and you can do this with the Book of Mormon. And I'm going to use the Book of Mormon because I think that as it was given for our day, it, it has really important patterns in it. And you will see as you go through, we think about the brother of Jared rending the veil. But if you really start from the beginning to the end and you think of Nephi, you think of Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, and you can go down, skipping and jumping here, um, all the way through Moroni, Mormon, you will see how many of, of these uh, were showing a pattern of rending the veil and, and abiding in Christ, receiving um him as their second comforter and, and his his presence and his glory it is showing a pattern for the times we live in especially of how this is to be done and there's a purpose in it there's a reason for it just as you see the mighty conversions happening and we all think about how that's for someone else and for me it's going to take a lifetime to have a, a mighty change of heart that's just as erroneous as it is for us to think oh well that's for someone else, and that isn't, doesn't apply to me. So now I feel to talk about Bruce R. McConkie. 
an apostle, the latter days. And he's going to help us finish some of the teachings about this before we talk about a little more about why, why is this so important? Um, why can't we just be obedient and just, you know, keep the commandments? Didn't President Nelson just say, live the higher holier laws and, and there's oil in the lamp? We're, we're going to discuss that after we finish this fractional coverage of the body of what's been spoken about uh, abiding with the Savior. And Elder McConkie was a wonderful man, and he um, he loved this doctrine, and he he espoused it, and he, he became it, um, he followed it, and I know that he had the veil rent, and that um, that he truly abided with uh, the Savior, or made the Savior made his abode with him. His last testimony, I feel to share actually here, just a portion of it, and it's it's about fifteen minutes long, and he goes through the life and the ministry and the atonement of Christ, but he finishes with these words. And now as pertaining to this perfect atonement, wrought by the shedding of the blood of God, I testify that it took place in Gethsemane and at Golgotha. And as pertaining to Jesus Christ, I testify that he is the Son of the living God, who was crucified for the sins of the world. He is our Lord, our God, and our King. This I know of myself, independent of any other person. I am one of his witnesses, and in the coming day I shall feel the nail marks in his hands and in his feet, and shall wet his feet with my tears. But I shall not know any better then that I know now that he is God's almighty Son, that he is our Savior and Redeemer, and that salvation comes in and through his atoning blood and in no other way. God grant that all of us may walk in the light as God our Father is in the light, so that according to the promises, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son will cleanse us from all sin. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I can never watch that or listen to that without feeling the witness that he did indeed know the Savior, that he saw him and that he was ministered to by him and that he lived walking with the Savior. He said of our day, Elder McConkie did, the millennial day is the day of the second comforter. Okay, so that's the day ahead, the millennial day. And whereas but few have been blessed with this divine association in times past, great hosts will be so blessed in times to come. What then will the nature of worship be during the millennium? It will be pure and perfect, and through it men will become inheritors of eternal life. And in this connection, be it known that it is the privilege of saints today to separate themselves from the world, overcome the world, and to receive millennial blessings in their lives. And any person who today abides the laws, the higher and holier laws of the Melchizedek priesthood, and Melchizedek priesthood we'll see is attached to the second comforter, here and now, the spirit and blessings of the millennium in his life, even though he is surrounded by a world of sin and evil. Okay, so President or Elder McConkie is telling us that this blessing is one of the millennium, and that's why we're to speak about it. That's one of the reasons we're to speak about it today, and, and, and generally, and as we talk about preparing for the second coming, if we're preparing for the second coming, we're preparing for the millennium, we are preparing for his reign, right? This is the day in this celestial sphere we're in 
where the comforter, which is so important, the gift of the Holy Ghost, can teach us all things which we should do. We're preparing for a day in which the King of Kings reigns in the millennium. And so we need to be prepared to be in his presence and to have that second comforter for that day. President or Elder McConkie is going on and saying, this is a promise that is available to us now. And, and you know, this was several years ago, but we live in a time of even more urgency for that, where that may have been something that that could have been and, and, and um, was available and certainly was, but few had, had um, received that as he described it, and that's, of course, relative. But we live in a day, as we get closer and closer to the second coming, where that becomes more and more important, to be able to abide his presence and to be able to be um, like Elias, right? To be able to be those who warn and prepare and deliver others ahead of his coming. We are not here to be spectators. We are supposed to participate. Okay, so this is something that's really important. Um, I, I know people say, well, of course, the prophets, but that's not really for us. And it's just, that is completely inaccurate. Seeing the Lord is not a matter of lineage or rank or position or place of precedence, says Elder McConkie. Joseph Smith said, God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve, and even unto the least saint, so even me, may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. For the day must come when no man need say unto his neighbor, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know him, from the least to the greatest. And that's speaking of his coming. The fact is that the day of personal visitations from the Lord to faithful men on earth has no more ceased than it has the day of miracles. And even as we don't believe in miracles, we don't believe this. We, we don't believe this fact. We still have the veil of disbelief over us. And we have to rend the veil of disbelief before we can rend the veil between the celestial and the terrestrial, between us and the Lord. We have to cast this false idea, this celestial scale. We talked about that in the previous discussion. We have all these false concepts. Oh, that's for the prophet. Is actually a false concept that is something that is put upon us by the adversary. And we may think, well, that's associated with the gospel. What does that have to do with the adversary? It's not worldliness, but it is a false concept that he has put. It is a philosophy of man mingled with scripture. The day of personal visitations from the Lord to faithful men has no more ceased than it has the day of miracles. God is an unchanging being. Otherwise, he would not be God. The sole issue is finding people who have faith and who work righteousness. The sole issue is the only thing. For if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Wherefore, he showeth himself, not himself, unto, until after their faith. Right? Ether 12, 12. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We talked about what it means to be pure in heart. And I, you know, if that's something that you feel to go back and look at, um, I would invite you to do it. Or to just to study again that principle. Because it involves these false beliefs, in, even as much as it involves the... Um, uh, being free from sin, which is about repentance and not perfection, remember. The Book of Mormon rendition is even more express. It says, And blessed are all the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Ten days after laying the cornerstones of the Kirtland Temple, the Lord said unto his little flock, Inasmuch as my people build a house unto me in the name of the Lord, and do not suffer any unclean thing to come unto it, that it be not defiled, my glory shall rest upon it. Yea, and my presence shall be there, for I will come unto it, and all the pure in heart that shall come unto it shall see God. Okay, so now we have another overlay here. There's something special, and we know this generally, but as it relates to coming into his presence, there's something special about the temple. All the pure in heart that come unto it shall see God. And we're going to talk more about the temple and about the promises of him coming into his temple in New Jerusalem, but about how important the temple is in, in rending the veil. But if it be defiled, I will not come unto it. When the Lord has a house on earth, it is the natural and normal place for him to use in visiting his earthly friends. What a beautiful statement and true statement. President Nelson said, It is significant that the Savior chose to appear to the people at the temple. 
And he showed us over and over again and talked it over and over again about him coming to his people at his first coming at the temple and showing that image of how that happened as he was in the same uh, discussions inviting us to be in the temple. Other McConkie goes on, it was the to the Kirtland Temple, the first holy temple of this dispensation, that Jehovah came on April 3rd, 1836, to be followed by Elias, Elijah, and Moses. And so we turn to the Kirtland Temple to see the literal nature of these promises, that the pure in heart shall see God. And what happened in the Kirtland Temple is but illustrative of what can be in any of the Lord's houses. Whenever his worshiping saints generate the faith, to pull down from heaven these same heavenly manifestations. This is so important, and I hope you feel those words. We're not waiting for some future event, certainly not his coming in his glory, to see the Savior. And, and, and this really, as I said, is not just about seeing him. It's about him teaching us personally, him abiding with us. And we're going to, as we talk in the end here about the temple specifically about, about what President Nelson has said that he teaches us there directly. Uh, it's so important to realize this is a this is a reality. I promise you this is a reality and it's something that we need to not have this veil of disbelief preventing us from understanding and truly believing that the Savior is in his temples. There is no question but that the pure in hearts do see God. Associated with the promises that the pure in heart shall see God, it is the decree that those who are not pure in heart shall not see the Lord. It's so important to understand what it means to be pure in heart, right? Um, to understand what, what Elder McConkie is saying here. Even Moses, with whom it was the practice of God to converse on a face-to-face -face basis, was denied that privilege on one occasion, as these words of Scripture attest. And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger is kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee and thy people. That's pretty heavy. For thou, for there is no man among them that see me at this time and live, for they are exceedingly sinful, exceeding sinful. And no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time that shall see my face and live. This is an important uh, scripture here and principle associated with this. To help us remember that not being in the presence of the Savior um, is actually a protection and it's a mercy to us. You know, there's responsibility, obviously, that comes with greater light and knowledge, and certainly that is greater light and knowledge. But it is a protection to us. But it's also important to recognize that these, these uh, words are not saying that only the perfect man and I don't want to go all the way back into what it means to be pure in heart, but uh, the perfect man or woman can see God. Remember that repentance is real. And this is, we're going to talk about this too here before we finish. This might get kind of long, hopefully not. But um, that being free from sin and being perfect in Christ is about believing in him, accepting his, his wonderful atonement, and repenting as we become more and more like him. It's about becoming like him. And that's that's the great secret revealed at the end of all of this. But, but no one should read this and think, well, I will never be free from sin, therefore I may as well just stop thinking about this principle. It's just not accurate. And, and I hope before we're done that if anyone feels that, that they will not by the time we finish. And he continues here. I know this is a long quote, but this is so important. There's so much in this. And, and like I said, this is a fraction of what's been said. But, but some of these are the ones that I felt to pull out here to help um, understand or just to help confirm things that, that uh, you felt um, or to, uh, to maybe add dimension to those things that you've been taught, that we've been taught. And all who are now living these laws to the full which will enable them to go where God and Christ are and there enjoy eternal association with them. That is all who are now living in its entirety, the law of the celestial kingdom. Okay, the law of consecration that we're talking about as we uh, prepare to and, and, and associated with charity as well, are already qualified to see the Lord. Usually what happens is that we, we fail to believe. 
The attainment of such a state of righteousness and perfection is the object and end toward which all the Lord's people are striving. We seek to see the face of the Lord while we yet dwell in mortality, and we seek to dwell with him everlastingly in the eternal kingdoms that are prepared. A little bit more, he says, Our scriptures contain such counsel as, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Seek the face of the Lord always. We are commanded in this, right? That in, the, in patience ye may possess your souls, and ye shall have eternal life. We know that all things are governed by law, and that when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. All, for all who will have a blessing at my hand shall abide the law which is appointed for that blessing. And the Lord says, and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. This means that if we obey the law that enables us to see the Lord, we've talked about the law of consecration. We've, we've heard that President Nelson is saying that to be prepared to receive him, we need to be reading the higher and holier laws. He's, this is all tied together. These are all tied to this principle. There is no secret as to what the laws, what laws are involved. They are everywhere recited in the scriptures. That which must be done is described in various ways in various, in different passages. But the general meaning is the same. It all comes down to one basic conclusion, that, that of keeping the commandments. Let us now consider some of the specific things the scriptures say we must do if we are to see the face of God while we are yet mortals. The pure in heart shall see God. This we've already seen. But we restate it again because the process of becoming pure in heart is the process that prepares us to see the face of deity. In an early revelation, the Lord spoke to of the members of his newly set up kingdom, earthly kingdom as mine own elect. Of them, he said, they will hear my voice and they will, shall see me and they shall not be asleep. Okay, this is, this is his people. This is what the Lord says of his people. They will hear my voice and shall see me and shall not be asleep and shall abide the day of my coming, specifically referring to his second coming, for they shall be purified, even as I am pure. And we're going to come back to that because this is, this is so important here. This verse is so important. For they shall be purified, even as I am pure. Think of Moroni 7, 48. This is where it comes. This is what it comes down to. This is preparation for the second coming. John spoke similarly when he described what our Lord's imminent, what is now our Lord's imminent appearance. And this was in the 80s, right? He was saying that. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Okay? It's the same concept associated with that, which is teaching charity in Moroni. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope, hath this hope in him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And so in all of this, right, what we know is that becoming pure, pure of heart, and that's the reason that I was prompted to have the, the discussion on that, is, is what qualifies us and what brings us to this point. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, is what in the end <clears throat> spiritual preparation is for his second coming. It's what it is. All of these the videos, all these discussions, this is what it is. We have to be like him, and it's possible, and that seems like a lot, and we're going to talk about more about why that, how that is possible. But what we know is the mission, becoming pure, is what opens and melts, really, the veil. And it also is what prepares us for his coming. Knowing that Christ is pure, and that if we are to see him now, or be with him hereafter, we must be as pure as he is pure, this becomes a great incentive to purifying the purifying of our lives. A perfectly stated and marvelously comprehensive formula that shows us what we must do to see the Lord is given in these words. Verily thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. Who made this promise? The Lord Jesus Christ. To whom is it given? To every living soul. What, what, what must we do to see his face? Five specifics are named. Forsake our sins, for no unclean clean or impure person, no sinful man can abide his presence. Come unto him. Accept him as our Savior. 
receive his gospel it has, it has been restored in our day call upon his name in mighty prayer as did the brother of jared obey his voice do what he directs put first in our lives the things of his kingdom and i think back on all of these things these are things we've, we've talked about in these discussions and certainly this is just one way that these have been revealed to you or shown to you in your lives and the scriptures and the words of the prophets are what matters and that's what we tried to pull into those but by letting go of the world and overcoming the world and saying i am done with the world i thy will be done father i want to do thy work i want to walk with thee i want to serve thy son that is this part of the qualification close our ears to the evil voices of the world and remember we talked even even last time the topic that was discussed not being entangled in earthly things and that that can mean even things that are ancillary to the second coming if our level of discussion and the, the spending of our time and our voices are celestial then that's where we'll live that's not where the savior is ultimately and there are good causes and good things to do and certainly in times past there are things that need to be done and even now there are things but if our focus is there and if we are preaching that even if the majority of our voice is sounding and speaking of the Gadiant and robbers we are still dwelling in the this celestial kingdom the majority of our focus should be about sanctification the majority of our discussions the majority of our study and our time well, that's one of the reasons why we're in the temple that's why we're about doing his work that becoming our focus is what brings us closer and closer to the veil consider again the pattern of third nephi just as things were getting at their, to their very worst before the savior uh, came and things truly fell apart if you really look closely you'll see that some of the saints were waxing stronger and stronger in humility they were serving day and night it says that's interesting like putting all their time towards service to the lord um they they were teaching of christ that the the prophets that come and flood the land which are really just those with the spirit of prophecy are testifying of christ speaking of repentance and redemption that's their focus right and at the same time you see that there's disputations in the land and there's all these disagreements about even about the signs there are disagreements and all these disputations and then focus especially on nephi and nephi was having angels ministering to him daily and so strong was his his power of, of the word that no one could disagree with him they didn't like him but he was just preaching of christ and that was his focus so we dwell on we testify of christ we do not dwell on the darkness don't give a shred of your emotion to hate to bitterness to the to temporal revenge think about where president nelson's thoughts are most of the time are they on all the things that are spinning celestially in the world or are they focusing on is he focusing on um things that are celestial is he exerting his mind and his his heart to um calling down powers from heaven and on exercising faith think of where the angels thoughts are you know we teach of christ we prophesy of christ we preach of christ we have done with lesser things we're to rise above this fallen world as president nelson told us we we've learned that exercising faith and prayer and charity is truly where the greatest power is it's not in terrestrial celestially fighting things back and forth um alma remember saved alma the younger and indeed so many of the dissenters through the preaching of christ and praying for him and and them uh that's that's how he had the greatest success that's where the greatest power is is in being yoked to the savior and exercising a fullness of the priesthood he called down the powers of heaven as his army right without being without really wallowing in celestial things so this is a little bit of a side and kind of just a tying this to the last one um but it doesn't it doesn't mean we don't do our civic duty or we try to have people 
try to have the law followed uh, and things like that. But this is a unique time that we live in. Um, we, we just need to realize that it's not the greatest power. And we don't give Satan any tiny bit of power by giving into emotional contention. If we're honest, we'll realize that many, many people are giving Satan power and hate when they think that they're fighting him. Such an important thing. The disasters are going to grow in number and in scale. It will be, with most of them, a great temptation to cede to contention and to become part of the morass. But we're to rise above this fallen, sin-saturated world. Um, and that's a very important message that that's where true power is going to be protecting the saints is through priesthood and, and through our connection to the, to the Lord being above it. We need to be flooding the airwaves with Christ, not with telestialism and not with, um, you know, theories and disagreements and disputations even among about the signs, right? Uh, Satan really wins when all that's talked about is him, no matter which side the contention is on. Um, and one last thing, before the power goes out, there will be so many things that happen that it really will be a major temptation to just be engaged in and consumed by all of it. It's going to be crazy, and it already is getting that way. And it's what you're going to see is that the internet will be completely almost consumed by that before it goes away to the almost complete exclusion of Christ. The good news, the light, just ahead of what is probably a lot of civil unrest, if not civil war. Keep the commandments, endure in righteousness, be true to the faith. Those who do these things, being pure in heart, there it is again, pure in heart shall see God. Okay, one last part from here, and then we're going to just break down just a couple of these um, how-tos a little bit. Faith and knowledge unite together to pave the way for the appearance of the Lord to an individual or to a whole people faith and knowledge. The brother Jared saw the Lord because he had a perfect knowledge that the Lord could and would show himself. His faith on the point of seeing within the veil was perfect. It had become knowledge. Because he knew nothing doubting, he saw. This is so important. The story of the brother Jared is a pattern of coming into the presence of the Lord. It's not about the barges, those temporal tasks that prepared him. You know, and I hearken back to the experience that we had here on this hill and the things that we had happen, the things I had happen for me personally of being prompted to prepare temporally and how that brought me closer through the doctrine of Christ, through the spirit of revelation to being able to hear him better and better and how it brought the people here, um, our neighbors closer to him, to be able to hear him. It was always about trying to understand and commune with him more and more until we could, by seeing the miracles of him answering our prayers and him speaking to us, gain a knowledge. I'm going to talk more about that, but the story of Brother Jared is so important. Because he knew nothing doubting, he saw. Moroni, who had had the plates of ether, who had summarized the account of Moriankomer's great vision, tells us why that prophet saw his God because of the knowledge of this man, he could not be kept from beholding within the veil. Moroni says, and he saw the finger of Jesus, which when he saw, he fell with fear. For he knew that he was that it was the finger of the Lord, and he had faith no longer, for he knew nothing doubting. And it's important here to think even in this instance of the temple, and to think of how the brother of Jared first saw the hand, right, the finger, the hand of the Lord, and was asked questions and was being proved as to his knowledge. And when he showed that he had that knowledge, he could not be kept within the veil. And it was then that he rent the veil. There's a pattern in the brother of Jared that is related to the temple and is related to overcoming and being brought back into the presence of the Savior and the Father. Having this perfect knowledge of God, he could not be kept within from within the veil, but therefore he saw Jesus and he did minister unto him. And in that day that they shall exercise faith in me, saith the Lord, even as the brother of Jared did, that they may become sanctified in me, then will I manifest unto them the things which the brother of Jared saw, even unto the unfolding unto them all my revelations. Okay, this verse in Ether 4 is so important. In that day that they shall exercise faith in me, is speaking of our day. 
and shall exercise faith, even as a brother of Jared, then that they may become sanctified in me. There it is again. That's pure of heart, becoming pure of heart, becoming sanctified. Then will I manifest unto them the things that the brother of Jared saw. What a promise that is. Even unto unfolding unto them all my revelations, saith Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heavens and of the earth, and all things that in them are. Okay, and this is all from an awesome um, book by, by Elder McConkie, all the things we've been talking about here. But a, a little bit more about the brother Jared. We know, as it is written, there were never greater things made manifest than those which were made manifest unto the brother of Jared. For the Lord saith, said unto me, They shall not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and become clean before the Lord. He's talking again. I hope you can see some of these interweaving principles and, and, and prophecies that in this day, when the saints are ready to be sanctified, that they would come forth. And that's this last dispensation. That in this day, this promise is available. That we can see what the brother of Jared saw. And that relates to the Savior, and it also relates to the knowledge that he was given. And you look at this, and interestingly, Urim and Thummim is associated with receiving this knowledge, both for the brother of Jared, as it was for, for others in the scriptures. But most importantly, they received a knowledge because they desired to understand. They desired to see things as they really are and to know things as they were known. From Abraham to Moses to the brother of Jared to so many Nephi, so many, um, so many prophets and, and individuals had this desire. But there is, in our day, there's a specific purpose for that as well. And we're going to talk about a really important quote that speaks to, aside from having that hungering and thirsting after knowledge and, and light, which is incredibly good and important and reason in and of itself, there's an additional layer of reason for us to understand things as they really are, to be able to withstand the, the heaviness that is ahead and to be able to deliver others from it. So as I mentioned the recipe is in these stories, and I think the Spirit can guide each of us to go in and look at these stories and see what helped these individuals rend the veil. When you look at even the story of Enos, you see that he looked at what his father had taught him, um, that he desired, he thought on the words that he had heard his father speak, and it sunk into his heart that he, his soul hungered and that he kneeled before his maker and cried, wanting to have that knowledge for himself. Through the day into the night, he had this great desire. So you see the presence of desire to understand, um, to, to uh, gain further light and knowledge is so critical. And then he's forgiven. And so you see repentance here. And he has he, truly what he does here, and part of the key of this, right, is to approach the Lord with a contrite, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And that, of course, just means an open and a willing heart, one that will believe. And that's one of the things I, I really feel to say that that's one of the things that holds us back more than anything else. We just can't bring ourselves to believe the, the depth and the breadth of the privileges that we have. We live so far beneath our privileges. But he opened his heart and he wanted to to receive um he this was really is the, the broken heart and the contrite spirit he was willing to act on what he received and then his sins were swept away and he said lord how is it done and you would expect to have this long list of things right well you did all these things you create you completed this great long to-do list in my service and therefore you could have this change of heart. And, and, you know, we're really speaking to this precursor to being able to be in his presence. A little bit more on being pure of heart. But the answer is, because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard or seen. And that's it. That's it. 
is because he believed. Okay, let's go to the story of the brother of Jared and the be before he rends the veil. And I have, since my, my mission, have felt this attachment to the story of the brother of Jared and the brother of Jared himself. And, and I think I've spoken some about this, but I, this is such an important story. There is so much in this to being spiritually prepared as well as temporally prepared, right? He's given a temporal commandment to build barges. And that's how I've said, I think, in the past that, um, that performing these temporal tasks that are kind of the blood above the door, showing that we believe that the Savior's coming again, are as part of us learning the spirit of revelation and showing him this faith in the, the good news uh, that we are looking for with gladness to his coming. But he's chasing for three hours for failing to call upon the name of the Lord. A similar thing happened to me. And I told you that experience at the beginning where I had that wonderful witness um, when I told the Lord in a much weaker way than, than Enos and the brother of Jared. But I had this moment of prayer where I said, I don't, I don't, and I, and I had to get to this, like the spirit had to help me get to this to say, I don't need my house. If it's, if it's meant for it to go and there's a trial for me, something to learn from this, then thy will be done. Um, and then a, a trial that came after that wonderful experience with a, in my work where I had to go through an awful thing um, and get through closed heavens and be chastened a little bit more. And um, anyway, for me, I had this experience and I, I won't go through all of it. It was an, an amazing experience for me, just like him. And then I was given a temporal task, go and help people get prepared. And I did that. And we did that together. We, we worked on things temporally. But then the brother of Jared is brought to this moment where as he's learning the spirit of revelation and he's getting increasingly difficult questions um, that he's bringing to the Lord. One of them, you know, the Lord just says, build barges. And then the Lord starts having him work on things and propose things. And in the end, the last question that he has, right, is one where the Lord says, well, you, he almost infuses doubt into the, his mind, it would seem, if you look at it on its face. He's asking for light. He says, well, you can't have windows. Um, you can't have fires. What, you know, what do you want me to do? And, um, and so then this miracle happens between Ether 2 and Ether 3. You know, what would you that I should prepare for you? That we see him, probably angels involved in, in guiding him to, to these stones and helping him understand this, this, this uh, principle. But then he's so full of faith and this prayer that he gives is a portion of how it is done, of how we rend the veil. You see in this prayer, this beautiful, wonderful prayer, faith um, and then humility. We know that they are, ho they are holy. We are unworthy before thee. You've given us a commandment that we must call upon it. We can receive according to the um, according to our desires. Faith again. Thou hast been merciful. Gratitude. Turn away thine anger from this people. Suffer that they not that they shall go across this raging deep in darkness. Charity for his people. You see manifested here. He's not asking for himself. And then, then he just pours on faith. I know, Lord, thou hast all power. Thou canst do whatever thou wilt for the benefit of men. Touch these stones. He's approaching the throne boldly, even though he came to, to um, it and him in humility. And they shall shine forth. Faith again. Thou canst do this. We know there are about five instances of demonstrated faith here. How is it possible, said Enos, because of thy faith. Lord, thou canst do this. We know that thou art able to show forth great power. His mightiest works are ahead of us, even greater than this. And the veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother of Jared, and he saw the finger. And then he's asked these questions, and he's at the veil. Because thou knowest these things, you're redeemed from the fall, you're brought back into my presence, I show myself unto thee. He's redeemed from the fall. He received his calling and election, right? He was told that, that um, he is redeemed. Because of the knowledge of this man, he could not be kept from beholding within the veil. He could not be kept 
from seeing the Savior. And there are so many scriptures, of course, about, about this recipe, about obtaining further light and knowledge, and having the faith and the desire to rend the veil. You know, Nephi, desiring to see the things that his father saw, uh, is part of this pattern. Um, even the Savior at Lazarus' tomb, thanking, and gratitude is a part of this pattern, right? Recognizing, thanking before the miracle happens, that it was, it was going to happen is both faith and gratitude, uh, showing that, showing forth there as, as part of this pattern of prayer uh, that, that helps us to, to run the veil. And just this pattern of being, um, believing is so much more important than, than works as it relates to this. But I have uh, I could go on and on forever about some of these things that are around it, and um, and thanks for sticking with me. I know that these these can be long sometimes. I think that the most important part I feel that the most important part of this here is at the end. So a couple more things, and then and then a, f a few things to say just at the very end here. It is so important for us to realize and believe that the Lord wants to reveal His mind to us, and that the mysteries of the kingdom, the mysteries of godliness are something that he has invited us and really exhorted us to to know and understand. And I'm going to show you some things here. This is how the Lord teaches multidimensionally. I can show some things and I can say some things and they may not always be the same, but for those who really want to dive into this, you can see how many first scriptures speak to that invitation to understand you know we know that nephi had a great knowledge of the mysteries of heaven that he he desired to know more we talked about abraham desiring to know more and to understand um alma uh, to many is given to know the mysteries you can see it throughout scriptures here and i'll just show some of these if you ask you shall receive revelation and shall know the mysteries of the kingdom uh, he who keeps the commandments will be given to know the mysteries. To them I reveal all mysteries. The greater priesthood holds the keys to the mysteries. Okay, and remember we talked about that principle. That the mysteries of the kingdom are associated with the Melchizedek priesthood. At his coming, the Lord will reveal hidden things which no man knew. The Melchizedek priesthood is to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom. Um... It, really important to remember and uh, recognize that that invitation has always been there and that in fact as, is, as we see in Mormon 9 those who deny the revelations of God and say they are done away and there are no revelations or prophecies or gifts or healings or speaking of tongues or interpretation of tongues he that denieth these things knoweth not the gospel of Christ he has not read the scriptures or he does not understand them President Nelson has told us that one of the things that the Spirit has told him repeatedly is how the willing the Lord is to reveal his mind and will, and that is to all. Joseph Smith read this, God has not revealed anything to Joseph, but he will make known unto the twelve, and even, even to the least saint may know all things as fast as he's able to bear them. Um, Ether 4 speaks of it as we reference DNC 76. And to them I reveal all mysteries, the hidden mysteries of my kingdom. I'll make known unto them my, the good pleasure of my will concerning all things pertaining to my kingdom. And there's association with making known these mysteries, as we saw there in Ether 4 and elsewhere, associated with the last days, that in the last days things will be made known that hadn't been. And we, you know, President Nelson has spoken to this too, that he will show things in these last days greater than have been shown Open your ears that you may hear, and your hearts that you may understand, and your minds that you may, in your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to you. If you shall ask, you shall receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge. Thou may know the mysteries and peaceful things which bringeth joy and eternal life. So, so many, so many things. And, and Joseph Smith, I guess I'll end on this one. Just felt that we needed to talk generally about the mysteries of which this is one. And, um, and more than one, I guess, tied up into this, but that we really are supposed to understand, you know, there are things you can learn about the gospel every single day, new things you can learn every day. If uh, you prayerfully ask, right, 
for further light and knowledge, and we hunger and thirst after righteousness and knowledge and light, and to be filled with light. But Joseph Smith said here that, and he's quoting, right, scripture as well as sharing after tribulations, interesting how a lot of people go through something hard before they really wake up and desire to have greater knowledge. Um, if you do these things, referring to making conversations more holy and loving, exercise fervent prayer and faith in the sight of God always, he will give you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost, that which has not been revealed since the word, world was until now, which our forefathers have waited with the ancient expectation to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels, which was held in reserve, again, speaking to these last days, for the fullness of their glory, a time to come in which nothing shall be withheld. We live in those days, and they will only increase. Whether there be one God or many gods, these shall be manifest. All thrones and dominions and principalities and power shall be revealed and set forth upon all which who have endured valiantly for the gospel. If there be bounds set in the heavens or to the seas or to the dry land or the sun or moon or stars, all the times in their rev revolutions, further light and knowledge, you see all the appointed days and months and years and the days of their days and the months and years and their glories and laws and set times shall be revealed. There's, there's mysteries in each one of these things, by the way. We've talked a little bit about time and about an understanding of the elements and things as they really are that will be actually needed as, as in the exercise of the fullness of the priesthood. But there's a lot in this, and I won't, I'm just you know, going to have the Spirit can take you into wherever it takes you. Shall be re revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of times, according to that which was ordained in the midst of the council of the eternal God and of all other gods before this world was that should be reserved unto the finishing and the end thereof when every man shall enter into his eternal presence and into his immortal rest and again this is not speaking of death this is speaking of the second coming and these are those days the mysteries of heaven are available and they are we are we are to look for them to understand them to search in the light of christ and by the words that have been revealed and then the, the savior will will teach us the rest, right? Um, and then as it relates to the temple, President Nelson has told us, and I just, I feel like I need to just share a couple of the things he said related to the power of being sanctified and finishing and being ready for the Savior's return in the temple. And I know I've shared some of these before, but um, we need to believe what he's saying and listen to these words and not rest the, the words or twist them or make them less than they are uh, the same the adversary wants to tempt us to dilute them into as as the words came to me this figurative oblivion where we just they have no meaning for us anymore they have no power but listen he says my dear brothers and sisters may you focus on the temple in ways you never have before he wants you to comprehend your privileges promises and responsibilities so there we'll see that we'll learn some of those things that are the privileges blessings and miracles that are promised us he wants you to have spiritual insights and awakenings you've never had before this he desires of all temp temple patrons no matter where you live so we go as frequently as we're able depending on where we live and we study when we can't be there we study the the principles and the covenants um and uh and the spirit of elijah meaning we can do family history even outside we can also hear him in the temple he said and that is true When you bring your temple recommend and a contrite heart and a seeking mind the Lord to the Lord's house of learning, he will teach you. He will teach you. There we learn how to part the veil and communicate more clearly with heaven. That is a direct statement and it needs to be believed. There we will learn how to rebuke the adversary and draw upon the Lord's priesthood power to strengthen those us and those we love. He endows us in the temple with his healing and strengthening power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. And that refers to, you know, the compensatory power and the power of the priesthood, a fullness of it. And uh, a fullness of the Spirit and indeed the, the second comfort, which is Christ. Satan certainly does not want you to understand that every time you worthily serve and worship in the temple, you leave armed with God's power and his angels have charge over you. Every minute of the time, meaning that time in the temple, 
will bless you and your families, family in ways that nothing else can. The temple has is a key component to rending the veil of unbelief and to being prepared for the Savior's return. And that brings us to Malachi 3. The Lord's messenger will prepare the way for the second coming. The Lord will sit in judgment. Is the header. I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who may abide the day of his coming? This is that phrase and that term, abiding his presence. Who shall stand when he shall when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And there's a lot in this. I'm not going to go into the offering of righteousness. Um, but remember at least that we sacrifice our will. That's what we have to put upon the altar. A broken heart and a contrite spirit is attached to this. Us being basically saying, all that I am is thine. But this purification process is tied into this. The temple is tied into this. And, and this is speaking of the last days when he shall appear in his temple. And we know that he'll appear in the temple in the New Jerusalem. And he will be and is in his temples right now, preparatory to his return with greater frequency, I believe, than he has been even during this uh, last dispensation. And now this quote from the Journal of Discourses from Orson, Orson Pratt that is so good because it wraps so many of these things together. It puts them together. Uh, it, it doesn't introduce anything new, but when you see it together, you'll hopefully the Spirit will, will show you and you'll understand or you'll remember or you'll have confirmed um, wherever you are at what is prophesied and, and where we're at and why it is important for us to prepare to be to return into the presence of the Savior. When the temple is built, the sons of the two priesthoods will enter into that temple in this generation. And all of them who are pure in heart, there's that word again, will behold the face of the Lord, and that too, before he comes in his glory in the clouds of heaven. For he will suddenly come to his temple, and he will purify the sons of Moses and Aaron, until they shall be prepared to offer in that temple an offering that shall be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. We just talked a little bit about that, a component of that. In doing this, he will purify not only the minds of the priesthood in that temple, and of course this this as we refer to the priesthood here, we are talking about men and women, but he will purify their bodies until they shall be quickened, renewed, and strengthened. Okay, think of the compensatory power and the words that were used there. Think also of eventual uh, translation that we know is actually a reality of the, the millennium. They will be partially changed, not to immortality, but changed in part that they can be filled with the power of God and they can stand in the presence of Jesus. Okay, able to abide his presence. And this is purification is the precursor to this required. And behold his face in the midst of that temple. Now here's another reason why this is important. It's not just to see him before he comes in his glory. This will prepare them for further ministrations among the nations of the earth. It will prepare them to go forth in the days of tribulation and vengeance upon the nations of the wicked. When God will smite them with pestilence and plague and earthquake such as former generations never knew. Then the servants of God will need to be armed with the power of God. They will need to have that sealing blessing pronounced upon their foreheads. Think back to the sealing on the foreheads, to the, um, the fullness of the priesthood and the reasons that we need to overcome, let alone right be brought back into his presence. But these other reasons that, that we talked about that we need to overcome so that we can usher in his coming talked a little bit about the 144,000 and about these who are to be fishers and um, those to be hunters and bring people out of Babylon during very difficult times to get people out of the fetal position and tell them the good news to help them see what's happening and to not despair and not think that we are entering a, a Mad Max world um, forever, but that these are temporary judgments and sanctification and an opportunity to come unto the Lord and to be safe in his Zion. 
that they can stand forth in the midst of these desolations and plagues and not be overcome by them. When John the Revelator describes this scene, he says he saw four angels. Now here we are tied to the angels again now. All these things that we've talked about, I hope you can see and remember some of them and see how they tie together. Ready to hold the four winds that shall blow from the four quarters of heaven. Another angel ascended from the east and cried to the four angels and said, Smite not the earth now, but wait a little while. How long? Until the servants of our God are sealed in their foreheads. What for? To prepare them to stand forth in the midst of these desolations and plagues and not be overcome. When they are prepared, when they have received a renewal of their bodies in the Lord's temple and have been filled with the Holy Ghost and purified as gold and silver in a furnace of fire, then they will be prepared to stand forth, stand before the nations of the earth and preach glad tidings of salvation in the midst of the judgments that are to come like a whirlwind upon the wicked. This is the all-consuming calamities. This is that scene that I can almost see. And I hope you can see and feel this scene of power and light in the midst of darkness and despair and judgment and calamity. That is ahead. And focus on the light. When we have overcome and when we've had this sealing in our foreheads of truly abiding with, with Christ, and we are in him as he is in us and as he is in the Father, which is the invitation that he's, he's given, then we are light. We are part of his light. We reflect his light and we point others and we bring others to that light and to physical places of light. And we are able to help them to overcome. There is so much that we could talk about on this topic. Um, and, I and I just love to talk about it. There's so much power and light and truth in this. And so much of what is ahead is tied into this. And I hope that it that it makes sense. And then in my great imperfection in sharing it, that um, the Spirit can make up and put things together for you. Um, I think I've said most everything that I'm supposed to say in this, but there's just a couple more things here. We, When I began this journey for myself um, a, f a few years ago, and I had these experiences that I've shared in part here, part of what I wondered was what does it mean to be prepared and and you know it's i looked at that temporally and I, I went through that process but as president nelson said that he was concerned about our temporal preparedness but he's even more concerned about our spiritual preparedness and so what does that mean um what is oil in the lamp was my question right what does it really mean obeying the commandments well yeah and and elder McConkie talked about that, but that's a part of it. And indeed, President Nelson revealed more on this when he gave that talk, Overcoming the World. And he said that being that living the higher, holier laws is necessary to being that people who are ready and able to receive him when he comes. But even that is not a the end of the equation. That is not living the holy or higher laws equals prepared. What I've learned about this, and this is just something to consider here, is that that's a component of it. It's a reflection of it. When we are living those higher and holier laws, we are becoming more like him. But what is the oil in the lamp? Keeping the law and keeping the commandments is, is not the fullness of the oil in the lamp. It is rather that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Becoming is oil in the lamp, to be like the Savior. When the, the closer we are to him, both rending the veil and abiding in him and having him abide in us, the more that we are like him, the more we are prepared. And it really being, becoming is preparation, becoming like him. And that happens through the enabling power. And, and this is the last thing that I feel that I need to say here is that it can seem so impossible for us. Well, if that's being spiritually prepared, I'm nowhere near like he is. And we can all say that. Um, and it's good to be humble and recognize that we are in our fallen state and to, to recognize that we, we can do no good thing. I can say no good thing without the Spirit. I can say and convey nothing of myself I've been left unto myself and I felt that difference without the spirit it doesn't work 
we need him and we need his light even to survive. But it's also for that very reason that he can do all things and that we can do all things in him, even in the same breath that Nephi says that he's being led not knowing beforehand, you know, he is sharing and he also knows that in Christ, in the Lord, he can do all things and nothing can stand before us and, and overcome us. And so knowing that, we have to remember that if he can do all things, one of those things is to change us. His enabling power is that he is not only mighty to save and he's overcome death and sin, but he's mighty to change. He's mighty to change us and we can become like him and we should look at it this way and not say, oh, we can't, I can't because I'm weak. We should instead say, I can because he overcame. It's on him that we can overcome. It's because of him. It's not because of us. It never was. It was always, it's always a misunderstanding for us to think that I fall short and I cannot change and become like him because I am weak. He already paid the price for that. He already suffered and experienced all things so that we could overcome. It was never about work or our merits. In 2 Timothy 3, 7 describes those who are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. It is not about work or self-help or even service that actually does it. Those things help us, but we reverse things so much. Even studying the scriptures and trying to obey the commandments won't work without the catalyst, which is belief. The prayer, yea, Lord, I believe, Help thou my unbelief is more important than a thousand self-help books in becoming, in changing. As Enos said, how is it done? Because you believe. As a story of Cory Timboom, who was a, a woman who was a Jew converted to Christianity and in concentration camps and in terrible places, um, watched her sister die and watched loved ones be tortured. And then afterwards is teaching about forgiveness and as she is doing so, a man, she sees a man who was a guard in one of those concentration camps, one of the cruelest guards that she remembered. And think of how she felt. I cannot become the person who can forgive this man. That's how she felt. And it, it's that story that she had, that she shares of this is not just about forgiveness. It's about changing our nature. It's about becoming and it shows you because what she says is that he comes up to her and he puts out his heart, hand and says, Fraulein, to think my sins have been forgiven me. And she says, I could not forgive him. I, I had no feeling for this man of, of love or f compassion. And it's understandable. How terrible would that be? But she does the right thing. She turns to the Lord and she seeks for his compassion and his love and his forgiveness. She seeks to have her nature changed in him. And she believes that he can do it, even though she knows that she can't. The natural man inside is not enough. And she says, I cannot forgive him, Lord. Give me your forgiveness. And then she felt through her this love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed her. And she learned, as she stated, and so I discovered that it is not our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the love itself. When he tells us to become like he is and to be therefore perfect, he gives us his, his perfection, his healing grace, and he changes us. It is him that changes us. And this is that last thing, that it is the miracle of the enabling power that changes us and that prepares us to enter into the presence of the Savior. What is the spiritual momentum, in fact, that President Nelson talked about, where we start growing and growing faster and faster towards um, spiritual perfection, is this. When we see it, we see that he's changed even a portion of us. He's taken something away from us that was a tendency that we always have. When we see a miracle, like when Corey Timboom experienced that, think of how much part of her faith became a knowledge she knew that he had changed her. And this is what Alma 32 is talking about. You'll see in there this pattern of a, a thing after thing, a portion after portion becoming a knowledge. There's no greater miracle than to see, personally to witness, 
the Lord change your heart to have no more disposition to do evil or even just a portion of that. And we don't need to think, well, I still have some, so that must not be me. Any of these changes, to have something taken away from us, to have our heart change in any way, whether it's about the way we feel about someone else because we're praying to have his um, charity and his love be given to us for them, or it's about overcoming some addiction or some tendency that we've had all of our lives, there's no greater miracle than to watch that. And, and it's a great miracle when we see it happen to someone else and we see, wow, you just totally have changed. That's a great miracle. But but it can't even be described how great of a miracle and assured a, a, a knowledge that we can gain when we see it happen in ourselves. Something is just changed. We no longer have this love for this temporal, celestial thing. Our heart isn't taken by this um, this activity or this tendency, uh, we know we don't care about even I think I mentioned, you know, the, the sport thing, the, the recreational thing that it was really can consume a big part of our heart. Uh, all of these things, and there's so many more, but when we watch our heart change and we feel that swelling motion, which is mentioned over a, a dozen times in Alma 32, there's a physical component to it. And remember, we talked about how the, the, see these these quotes speak to this physical change that actually happens. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. He, he spoke of specific to the last days. He changes our hearts. He changes our, our actual bodies. But the spirit is what's most important to realize and recognize. We see that change happen. We see ourselves change. And we know that he's there. And then we know that he can do the next thing. He can change the next thing if we will but believe and we will give it to him. And and layer by layer, this spiral goes up and this power increases and our doubts flee and our fear flees and our knowledge replaces faith in aspect after aspect, thing after thing. And what is this doing when our knowledge is replacing fear or faith and becoming more and more perfect? We're becoming like the brother of Jared to where our knowledge cannot, is such that we, are, we cannot be kept within the veil and the veil melts and we know that he is and we hear his voice and when the day comes that is his appointed day, we see him and he ministers to us and he commissions us ahead of his second coming and his coming in his glory. He gives us charge to do the thing that we were brought here to do which we're already doing in part, and we've already done in part, but there are things ahead. We're here in this moment for a very specific reason, for specific reasons. And those things, some of those things are yet ahead of us. And for many, they have something to do with warning, preparing, and delivering others around us. The most powerful experience that I had have had in the temple, which made some things that were previously a belief for me become a knowledge, were accompanied by him pointing me to, the Savior pointing me to these verses in the Doctrine and Covenants. Fear not, and this is Doctrine and Covenants 50, little children, for you are mine. I have overcome the world, and you are of them that my Father hath given me, and none of them that my Father hath given me shall be lost. And the Father and I are one. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. And inasmuch as you have received me, you are in me, and I in you. Wherefore, I am in your midst. He is already in our midst. And I am the good shepherd and the stone of Israel. He that buildeth upon this rock shall never fall. And the day cometh that you shall hear my voice and see me and know that I am. Watch, therefore, that ye may be ready. Even so, amen. We need to believe this. We need to understand the power of the prayer Yea, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. We need to know that his promises are true, that he has overcome, that through his enabling power, we can overcome. And that's his invitation to us right now. He wants us to be purified, to be brought back into his presence, to be commissioned to do his work and to prepare the way for his return, to help our brothers and sisters overcome and to see what is really happening and to see what's ahead. I know that he has purchased us with a price that he has already overcome. I know that he's coming back 
And I know that he wants us to abide with him and with our Heavenly Father. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.